we'll talk about the topics. All right. This time in Vayakel. Yeah, the 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 uh, the news that God had established a new covenant with the Jews, the Jewish people, with the second tablets, the second tablets that were given. Uh, what was the what was the special quality of uh, what was the special quality that the Torah describes in the siut leiv, the raising of the heart of the people who contributed and did work for the beta for the mishkan? It says that he whose heart will raise him up. What does it mean? Rise the heart raises you up. What does that mean? He's trying to disguise describe. And um, um, what was the special quality of the women who, why was it specially beloved to God, the women who brought the mirrors to the Mishkan? We once talked about this. Yeah, we got a little. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. The time, the, the period of time when the Mishkan was completed and when Hashem actually enters it, mm -hmm. comes, comes and brings His, uh, his uh, presence yeah. into it. And the act, what do we mean by the honor of Hashem filling the Mishkan? Mm -hmm. And then he has, a, he has a postscript, like an ending of Shmot, uh, like a little, an epilogue, you know, mm -hmm. to the end. Mm -hmm. He has also at the end of everything. So, let's see. Any any attraction? Mm -hmm. Everything is attracted by the... The second, the, the second covenant, or what it means to have the, the heart rise up? I think it's second covenant. Yeah? Yeah. I'll try with that. Aleph. So, Tav Kuf Nuk Haf Vav. It's a, a chapter 35, 35, verse 1. The very beginning. And Moses assembled all the congregation of the children of Israel. Assembled. Assembled all of them together, yeah. And it says that's so uh, it's interesting that this is the point he's trying to make is probably the way that the description he brought everyone together. Right? Mm -hmm. What is happening here that is everyone has to be together? It says like this, These are the words, the, the, the words that God commanded to do them. Six days shall you do work, right? In the next page, sentence. Mm -hmm. And the seventh day will be holy, a sanctified Sabbath to God. Everyone who does any malacha, any creative work in it, shall die. Lo tavaru esh b'chol moshvoteichem b'yom shabbat. Do not put on any kindle, any fire, light a fire in all of your um, sure, dwelling sure. places on the Sabbath day. Mm -hmm. um, and then he talks to them about how you shall bring all the things that you need to make the mishkan. Put together. So, what is this? <clears throat> what is this assembly? The first assembly that he comes here. Remember that uh, he came down from the mountain. At the end of the last parsha, he came down from the mountain. Hashem gave him the second tablet. His face was shining. He told the people what Hashem told them. They couldn't. They couldn't stand being to, together with him. He covered himself with a with a kind of a veil, and he would go into the mishkan whenever uh, to to the tent. God would speak to him there. He would have to tell the people from then on what he would have to tell them. He would come out and take off his visage so they could see his face shining when he spoke to them. And then he delivered Hashem's message and then he would cover his head again and cover his face again and go. That was the way the last Parsha ended, mm -hmm. right? Um, right? Think, yes. Um, how long Moses, Moshe, keep this, his Face shining. As far as we know, the rest of the time that he is in the until he passed. So 
So all the time he was wearing the belt. When he so just walked out to go to the butcher shop or to the supermarket, yeah. But he would go to the, to the Mishkan place, or to the tent to speak to a God, he would take it off. Yes. And then when he would come oh. out, he would take it off to speak to the people. Oh, God's words. Speaking to the people, he God's was taking oh, no. off. Oh, it's sorry. only God's words. There, yeah. And then when he went about his normal life after so that, we're not talking he about the he would cover his head. Sobs or the whatever happened right. and the roads or, or the Olympic, the, Olympics. The, 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 yeah. It's covered. His face is covered. Right. Very good. Okay. So the question that happens is what when he, he came down to speak to the people, right? Mm. And they describe how he spoke to the people. Then it says all of a sudden, and, and Moshe assembled, assembled all the people together, and he told them this business about Shabbat. Yeah. And then he spoke to them again, all the people, about how to make a Mishkan. Mm -hmm. So what is this assembly? What is the new news? The new news that he had to tell them. That's what the Ramban is going to be discussing. Right. So he says, if you see, Vayel Vayakel Moshe et kolad ban Yisrael, Yichlol koladat bnei Yisrael, ha'anashim v'hanashim. Mm -hmm. Both the women and the men, mm -hmm. right. all of them contributed both uh, things that they gave and also work that they would do, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, no problem. Yes? And therefore, Moshe. Achar shetziva le'aharon v'hanesiim v'kol b'nei Yisrael ha'anashim kol asher diber Hashem mitanu bar Sinai achrei shibor haluchot v'natan al panav masveh and now it seems that at the end of the last parsha I said he spoke to Aharon and to the elders and all the people after he came down from Har Sinai with his shining face mm -hmm. right and then just like I said, after he finished that, he then put out the word, I want everybody to come and come in assembly. I have something special to say, mm -hmm. right? The men, the women, the children, everybody should come. Mm -hmm. Until now he was talking to the people who met him when he came down to the mountain, right? But now he said, I want everyone to be here. What is going on? And it seems to him, to the Ramban, although it doesn't say when, right, exactly, mm -hmm. but it seems to him that it happened the day after he returned, mm -hmm. he went down from the mountain, This is important, we once talked about this, remember? Mm -hmm. He now tells them the commandment to actually do the building of the Mishkan, to prepare the Mishkan for Hashem, to come down and dwell among them, which he had already commanded them, before the Ego. If you remember, we talked about this, that there was a big disagreement between Rashi and the Ramban mm -hmm. about when is the commandment of the, all the utensils and all the way that the Mishkan should be built, that Hashem would come and dwell among them. When did Hashem command that? Right? So we said that it's written in the Torah, certainly before the Ego. Right? Mm -hmm. That's the way the text goes in order. But Rashi there says all along that that segment that talks about the contributions that they should bring and the making of the Mishkan is actually written there, but it doesn't belong there. It really was given by God as a commandment after the second Luchot, at this time, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when we are now talking about, when they came down. Mm -hmm. First, the Aserot that he brought were given. He was up in the mountain. He came down and he saw the Egel and he broke the Luchot. And then he waited until God would forgive them. And then now, when God forgave them, he said, okay, come on up on Yom Kippur. And he gave them the second Luchot. And he came down with his face shining. He then now tells the people, we are going to make a Mishkan. They never heard of a Mishkan before, going to Rashi. Mm -hmm. Now, new, new business, right? Mm -hmm. So you could speculate that according to Rashi, speculate, and only speculate, that some people say that according to Rashi, the intention originally was not that there should be a Mishkan. That people would have the Torah and they would have the mitzvot, right? But that there would not be a physical dwelling in the middle of the people where God would establish his presence. 
speculate that Rashi believes that that kind of religion, if not for the Egel, would have been more, their relationship with God and his presence would have been more like we are today. We walk around and Eliyahu can feel that God is with him. Right? Mm -hmm. Doesn't You don't have a Mishkan, mm -hmm. right? And you can feel this when you're walking around in Safran or whether you're walking around in Mawa or in the city, right? Even in Colombia, mm -hmm. right? Right. Wherever a person is. So, so in the first place, before the Egel, after the Hashem actually spoke to them face to face in the mountain, from the mountain, and they all heard the Aseret that he wrote, according to Rashi, I'm speculating, according to Rashi, the opinion is there wasn't an intention to make a Mishkan. Because the people wouldn't need the physical presence to give them the feeling that God was with them, right? The mountain, after all, is just a mountain. God speaks to them. Then after that, the, mount, this, the, the cloud and the fire and the glory goes away, and there's their mountain. Everybody remembers, yeah, God spoke to me on the mountain, mm -hmm. right? I don't need the mountain to be a holy place mm -hmm. anymore. Because God is not of this world, but he communicates with me. Right? So I don't need the Mishkan. I'm speculating that's the way the Rashi's position is. So much so that he says, even though it's written, the commandment to make the Mishkan before the Egel is written. Mm -hmm. The text, right? That's what we read. Mm -hmm. And then Kitisa comes and discusses the Egel. So he says, you know what? You, you just take that section and you put it after. Pretty drastic, right? The Ramban doesn't believe that. The Ramban has a very different, different opinion. This is what we learned two weeks ago, I think, together, right? The Ramban says that the original intention of the Matan Torah with the Aseret that he brought is that there should be a Mishkan among the people. And the Mishkan was going to be a representation of the experience they had on Har Sinai. Remember he described how the fire pillar on top of the Mishkan and the cloud was resembling the Har Sinai experience. Right? And that God spoke to Moshe in the mountain. Here God speaks to Moshe from between the Kuvim, right? And his voice comes out, just like it came to him from the fire on Har Sinai. Here is the gold of the Kuvim that is sort of fire-like that his word comes to Moshe, right? All of the all of the uh, and the fact that nobody else can go to the Mishkan and enter it is the same as in Har Sinai, where Hashem says nobody can actually walk up to the mountain until Hashem has already departed, right, while he's speaking to them. So like a, he tries to say that the model of the Mishkan is like a, a symbol of Har Sinai experience. And right. it was intended that it should be there. After Matan Torah, Hashem said, make me a Mishkan, and I will dwell among you. And this was going to be a very, very high profound level of an experience, that's the way it should, should be. That's the way it was supposed to be, right from the beginning. He gave them the mitzvot. Then, when the Egel happened, when the Egel happened, and Moshe comes down and says, oh, you have sinned a great sin, I don't even know what's going to happen with you, right? That made a, a postponement, at least, Maybe complete rejection, maybe complete cancellation of everything that God told you. We might be finished. You may, you may not be God's people anymore, right? Yeah. So it reason. comes the repentance, comes the long process of coming back, comes Hashem telling them, come, okay, I'm going to give you the second Luchot, come up to the mountain like we read last week again, and Moshe succeeds in getting Hashem to completely forgive the people, and even appearing to him in a more profound way with the Yud Gimel Midot, the 13 attributes which we read about last week, then Moshe goes down, and now he wants to tell them special news, the people. You know what? God has forgiven us completely. We are now in good graces again. The marriage is going to go, just like we thought it was going to be. We're not divorced. And I want you to tell you that all of those mitzvot which you heard before, about the Mishkan, which you were told before, according to the Ramban, all along, about the Mishkan, which was going to be the climax of the wedding mm -hmm. with God, yeah. that he will actually come to your mm -hmm. home that you make for him, we're back. We're going to make it now. That's what this batch is going to be, right? We're actually going to make it, which was, which was expected all along. All right. So that was, the, that was the good news of Hashem actually taking them back. According to Rashi, it's a new innovation. 
that God now gives them. Mm -hmm. According to the Ramban, it is the symbol of the embrace. You, you know, we were going to get married, there was almost a divorce, now we are going to get married, right? It's all, everything we expected is coming back now, according to the Ramban. So he says that that's what it was, right? That he now wants them all to come together. It was the day after he came out of the mountain, and he wants to tell them about, that's the sentence that you're reading here now, about the matter of the Mishkan, which was commanded in the beginning, before the breaking of the Luchot. Right? Yeah. Not like Rashi, he says, mm -hmm. So, at all, there were two covenants. The first one that was breaking, it was broken. The first and, one was broken, and, and now... Now it's also made a new covenant that goes with go right. in their midst. What is right. Ramban said, isn't it? Yeah. So, right, okay, very then, nice word. Sure. because God had completely forgiven them and come closer to them, and give them, and they gave them a second luchot, and established a new covenant with them, that Hashem will actually go in their midst, right. will come in their midst, right? right? right. Correct? That's correct. And he now returns to the original loving love affair that they had from the time that they were engaged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is, before the first Luchot. Right. And it will now be known to the people that his presence, his Shechina, will be among them. Just like he commanded him in the first place. That's what he said before. Right. That they shall make me a, a tabernacle so that I will dwell uh -huh. in their midst. Yeah. But because they were sinned, because they had sinned, it was postponed and it was set aside, right? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. now that he forgave them, the Shekhinah is going to come back and he commands them to make the Mishkan which they intended to do before. And that's why this, this parsha now continues. God, Moshe gets them all together, tells them about Shabbat, because according to most people it means... I'm going to give you now the commandment to actually make the Mishkan, but I want you to know that on Shabbat we don't make the Mishkan. There, this is the exception. The one day, you might mm -hmm. think, since it's such a great commandment to make the Mishkan, maybe we should do it every day, even Shabbat, because after all, it's a mitzvah to bring God among us, so for such a great mitzvah, you should even do it on Shabbat. Goes, no, no, I want to tell you, Shabbat is a holy day to God that is more important than making the Mishkan even. Mm -hmm. Right? Because, you might say again, Ideologically, it just means on Shabbat you are with God in a in a in a personal way, right? You're making the Mishkan for Him to be dwelling among the people, right? But Shabbat is your seance with God, so Shabbat it's, takes it's precedence over the Mishkan. That's why you don't make the Mishkan. You don't build the Mishkan on Shabbat because He's saying that if we have the Mishkan, He's going to dwell. Among, among you. So, yes. if in Shabbat, I know, I, I'm not working on it, I know. So, looks like uh, he is not dwelling among them. That's, where, that's why he said, Shabbat is Yom Shabbat Kodesh Lashem. Hayalachem Kodesh. The, the Shabbat is a holy day for you because that's your holy day with God. Shabbat. Mm -hmm. So, if you have Shabbat, you are already like the Mishkan. I mean, you you and your house. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the holy day of God with the Shabbat. Anyway, right. so, I mean, okay. it doesn't override the Mishkan. The Mishkan is one thing that you don't do with, is you don't do with the Mishkan on Shabbat. Every other day you work on the Mishkan. You make the Mishkan. We're so the, 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 Mishkan the, we're talking. the idea... Talk about building the Mishkan. We're not talking about the Avodah, the service Avodah. of the Mishkan. The service of the Mishkan took place on Shabbat too. There were sacrifices that were brought, mm -hmm. which were commanded as Shabbat sacrifices, special. Yes. Mm -hmm. We're talking about building it. All right. Weaving and melting gold and uh, weaving Nailing. and uh, doing and banking and whatever, right? Mm -hmm. right. right. Okay. So, so far, so good. Then, uh, so we did that uh, one topic. And then, what about this raising of the heart? What do we mean by that? That a person who will... You, I'll show you the, the, the sentences. It is in this chapter, uh, verse 21. 
Yeah. Verse 21, it goes like this. And they came, everyone whose heart stirred, up, stirred him, up, him up. Yeah. Two different kinds of words we'll see in a minute. Oto. Um, translation of the words. And they went out. They went out after Moshe told them all this speech about the that they're going to make the Mishkan. All of the congregation of Israel left from before Moshe. He just finished the speech. We're going to make the Mishkan, right? That's mm -hmm. what I just said. Because God is coming among us like we were intended to be. Mm -hmm. Now they went out before Moshe, after his speech, and they came, every one that whose heart raised them up. You say stirred him up. Nisa'o, laset means to lift. Okay, lifted him up, that his heart lifted him up. And everyone whose Spirit was generous. Mm -hmm. We'll see how those two verbs are two different things, right? One is the heart lifting me up, and the other one is my spirit is generous. I want to give. Right? Two different things. Right? I want to give. Is, is my heart steering me up to give? Mm -hmm. Or are they two different things? We'll come in a moment, but you just let's remember two different things. My yeah. heart steers me up, my spirit makes me want to give, right. want to bring all the contributions and the work of oil aid and all of the work that's needed to do. Okay? So in this sentence is a very interesting thing. Look at the Rashi, look at the Ramban in 21. Mm -hmm. He says, every one came whose heart lifted him up. Allah chachamin we're talking about all of the people who were skilled to do the work. Mm -hmm. Yomar came. Why does the Torah have to tell you that the people who are skilled, if you know how to weave, that is very special weaving that had to be done, or very special gold work that had to be mm -hmm. done, or very special... Uh, stones, precious stone works that had to be done. They have to grind the stones for the Khoshan. Or very special sewing that had to be done. Right? right? And architecture and shaping. Right. And, right. right? So if you know how to do that, you know how to do that. Yeah. Do you, does your heart have to lift you up to know how to do that? You did it because uh, you were once an apprentice. Your father taught you how to do gold work and you know how to do it. So some people know how to do that. Your friend over here is a good carpenter, and the friend over there is a good goldsmith, and the friend over here is a good person with gems and stones, and, and this woman over here knows how to weave and how to make cloth. So what's this business of raising the heart? So the Ramban has a very creative idea. He says like this, Yomar Cain, the Torah wants to tell you this, Kilo matzinu al nadvim We want to know, tell you that the people who contributed things that they had if you have ten dollars and you want to give, right? So we say your spirit makes you generous. That's the second verb, mm -hmm. right? Nidivut mm -hmm. leiv, the generosity of spirit. There were people like that also, right? Mm -hmm. Many people who had a jewelry or had some kind of precious uh, clothing that they took from the Mitzrayim. Remember when they left Mitzrayim? They brought it freely to give. That is a generous spirit, right? But you don't call it the siut leiv. You don't call it like the heart the lifting them up. What do we mean? Aval yaskir bahem nedivut. When somebody gives, you talk about generosity. Right. Vitam asher nisa olibo. But but what is the meaning of somebody whose heart raises him up? Lekarva el amlacha to bring him close to do the work. Why is that called lifting the heart? Because nobody, no. nobody among these people ever was taught to yeah, do anything. Exactly. Where were they? They were, they were slaves. slaves right? exactly. They were digging in the mud yeah. and they were taking straw and they were fix and they were mixing the straw with mud in order to make um, bricks. 
in order to carry it up to the top of the, uh, the, the buildings and put it in and, and put some more mud in between you imagine and a, then go down and do another one. That's what they did day and night. And can you imagine a, a, a man who's, who's working on, 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 on the bricks, their hands are very Callous, rough. Callous, exactly. How His muscles work and come big stuff. Come and, he's going to come and he's going to make little beautiful a little beautiful yeah. jewelry thing. Yeah. He's going to be, he wouldn't even dare to touch it, right? I mean, yeah. what, what does he know from these things? Yeah. And to make beautiful weaving, you know, of the other right. tapestries exactly. and understand? Impossible, wow. right? So, listen to this. Yeah. So, therefore, because nobody ever taught them, nobody had any experience like that, cloud. Aval matzavetiv o sheyedal asot came. They, a person, would hear what Moshe said. We need somebody who will make jewelry. We need somebody who will make jewel, uh, gold uh, vessels. There was a man sitting, standing there. He was a slave like everybody else. And he gets a feeling in his heart, I think I can do that. I would love to do that. I would love to do that, and I think I can do it. Let me try. Yeah. Let me do it. That's Nisiud Leif. That's oh, his, his heart. He gets great. inspired right. with, with, for no good rational reason. It's totally irrational. It's stupid. Well, who makes it? Well, why do you go to his friend? By and and says, what, are you me? what are you crazy? <laughs> yeah. Right? And, some, and then, God, then Moshe says, I need people who know who will make weaving of these beautiful tapestries. Somebody else down the row over here says, I, I, I'll do it. Right? He never did it in his life. It was a moment of nisiut leif. It was a moment of inspiration of heart right. that has no. It's not from the. It's not from the mind. It's from the heart. From the heart. Right. Yes. Intuitive intuition. Right. Intuition <clears throat> without any reason, without any experience, without any learning, without any degree, mm -hmm. no apprenticeship. Just I can do. I want to do. It, mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And other people thought he was crazy. Somebody else will pick up another thing. I can do carpentry. Right? Somebody would ask him, where did you ever do it? He says, I never did it, but I think I can do it. I, I feel I can do mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So he says, that's Nesi yeah. right? Yes. And people do this, I mean, it's a human truth, right? There are people who do great things sometimes who have absolutely no reason. I mean, no idea. They just get the intuition, I want to, I can, I will, and they take it and they go with it, right? I mean, it's a... And the Torah calls that Nesi'ut Leif. It's called a heart. It's an un unexplained, right? It's, it's not rational. It's a, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very special thing, very special thing that no one can understand. So the Torah calls it in Nesi'ut Leif, right? Mm -hmm. And therefore, he thinks that he can do it. And his heart rises up in the ways of God, whatever that means, and he gets inspiration to come to Moshe and to say to him, I can do it, I will do everything you tell me. Yeah. In this thing, right? Yes. And I already mentioned this to you in another place, 29, when was that? 31. Al Karati. Oh, 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 I see. Where there, he's talking about when Hashem says, I have called upon Bezalel. Remember, he yes, chosen Bezalel yes, yes. to be the special one. Yes. So what does it mean he called Bezalel? So he says he inspired him. 29 Karati B'Shem. You see it? Uh, yes. Ramban. I have called by name Bezalel, the son yeah. of Uri, the son of Ur. So what does he say there? I have called by name. And Moses said to Israel, see, the eternal had called by name. The reason for this is because Israel in Egypt had been crushed under the work in mortar and in brick. Right, they're slaves, right? Yeah. Go ahead. And, and had, had acquired no, no, no knowledge. No knowledge, no skills, no nothing, yeah? Oh, how to work with silver and gold and the cutting of precious stones and had never seen them all at all. It was thus a wonder that there was to be found amongst them. Such a great, a great wise-hearted man who knew how to work with silver and gold and in cutting it of stones for setting and in carving of wood a craftsman, an embroiderer and a weaver. For even amongst those who study before the experts, you cannot find 
one who is proficient in all of these crafts. Right? Even if you would find in general normal normal people, your an apprentice is gold, so he knows how to do gold. He doesn't know how to do carpentry. Here was a man, Batalel, who did was an expert in all of that. All of these. Out of the slavery, right? Yes. So he says, God says, I have communicated a miracle to this one. I have called him by name. We call uh, in English, we have a, somebody is, gets a calling, right? Mm -hmm. Gets a calling. God is yeah. calling, right. Him, right? right? And he and he's drawn, he's pulled by God's calling him, right? Mm -hmm. To do, to do. So he says, I've called Batalel by name, meaning I pulled him to me and I gave him these talents, right? Mm -hmm. so he felt that. Uh, so okay, so similar to this, right? Fish. So, yeah. So, Vihine. Um, <coughs> Amar And therefore now the Torah is telling you that people came before Moshe whose heart has raised them up to do all this work. And those people who were generous in spirit brought the contribution. So the work was done by people whose heart raised them up because they didn't know where they come from. It just came to their heart, right? Mm -hmm. And the generous spirit, of course, people had something, so they gave. All right. All right. Two different, two different yes. things. Ki kara Hashem mm -hmm. Moshe said to all of them, Hashem has called B'Tzalel and Eliyav, and he, they have the talent, and they could supervise. Right? And then he called upon people who would have the talent, who are ready to work, and together would do the work. Okay, so when I once learned this uh, Ramban, it's very, to me, it's very, very special to try to imagine such a scene. Right? Try to imagine such a scene, all these slaves, mm -hmm. you know, and all of a sudden Moshe says, we're going to make this beautiful jewelry, who's going to make this? And somebody says, oh, you know, this kind of a thing. It's ridiculous. And it only comes from some profound inner stimulus that has no, no explanation, right? It's very special. So and when I was speaking about this, it was already moving, Ramban, to imagine such a scene. So she first made a, a statement. She said, you know, it makes me think of one of the children of those people, the children of the children of the children of a child of a child of a child, many generations later, standing in front of Bergen Blelson mm -hmm. or Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. And people are lined up coming off the trains. And somebody, one of the German officers said, Who is a tailor here? Mm -hmm. And who is a doctor here? Who's a cook here, right? They, they wanted certain people to do certain mm -hmm. things. So people, some people would stand, most people would. I'm not a tailor. But I want to survive. But he wouldn't know, nobody would know anything about anything. But all of a sudden somebody would stand forward, I'm a tailor. <laughs> somebody else would say, I'm a cook, right? And she, she imagined that this was a tradition of one of those people who stood mm. forward, who said, I can do that! Mm. And I'm in the mission. Uh, it's just amazing, you do his imagination, you know. To, and, and so that person is somehow daring, you know, to, to say, I can do this. Mm -hmm. And of course, if they were tested to find out if he can do it, who knows if he could do it, right? I mean, it was, but they struggled and they learned, and maybe the next guy who knew how to do some sewing, they taught him a little bit, but and he, somehow he survived. This is a part of the community of the Jewish people, because we never stopped. We can learn, for example, uh, uh, you are a, a doctor, but you can make in some scenario, if you are pulled to do something, I can do it. Because, you know what? I you think also have to believe in yourself. Exactly. You have to believe in yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's how to design. Not, Here they were so they were so excited about making the Mishkan mm -hmm. that even if they can't, they say, I I, I want to, you know, I will overcome yeah. all the obstacles, I want to do that, right? Even though it's like this in this thing. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. So beautiful. Beautiful Ramban, right? Yeah. So short but gorgeous. 
So, so remember, the word nisa'olibo to him is lifting of the heart, is that, is that right. impulsive inspiration to overcome. Right? It's beautiful to understand these two particular words. No? Yeah, so well, generous spirit generous and, and lifting of the heart. Two yes. completely different things. Which is more valuable? No idea. Yeah. Which is more valuable? Well, <laughs> they, both of them are great because we shouldn't put down the generous spirit. The generous spirit person, the normal, normal human feeling is, this is mine. Yes. That's normal. I'm going to give my, sh my jacket away. You need a jacket, get a jacket. I have to be, I'm going to be cold because I have to give my jacket away. Right? I have a cell phone. I mean, I'm, it's my cell phone. Give me that. You see, I mean, the natural impulse is not to give. Yes, yeah, exactly. Mine is mine and yours is mine. Yeah, yeah. I remember the <laughs> Pekei Pe Avot. In Pekei Avot, there's a, there's a dispute about that. What kind of people, different kinds of people are considered to be a, a special, average, and bad. So they have an example, you know, a special people is people who say, what's mine is yours, and what's yours is yours. I don't need anything mm -hmm. from you, but mm -hmm. anything you need, I will give you. I can take your share of my back. You need something, I, I want to give you, right? Mm -hmm. Special is must be. You are. Right? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Then the other, <laughs> then the other, the, the other kind of person says, you know, the average person who says, you know, I have my thing, and you have your thing. I won't take your stuff, and you don't take my stuff. We coexist. Yeah. We coexist. Mm -hmm. So some people say about him, about that kind of a person, that's average. Mm -hmm. That's average. Right? The third worst category is, you know what? What's mine is mine, but I want what you have. Give me what you have. That is, that's a bad person, right? obviously wants to take, only to take. He doesn't want to give, he wants only to take. So that's what the Pekka Avot says. That's the plain understanding. Then there's one person who says, you know what? No, no, no. The average person is not the person who says what's mine is mine and what's yours is yours. We said that was average. There's one person who says, that is bad person. That is a bad person. Because mm -hmm. he hasn't learned to give. He hasn't learned to give. That's a bad person. The person who says, I want to keep mine and I want to take yours, that's Sedona. Mm -hmm. and I'm over. Right. That's, that's like vicious. That's, we're not even talking about that kind of person. Mm -hmm. But the person who says, me, mine, leave me alone, and you stay on your side, I stay on my side, that's a bad person. We, some people say that's average, because mm -hmm. it's normal. Mm -hmm. But the other opinion is, it's normal maybe for a baby who's born, yeah, right? When a baby's born, he has his hands like this. Mine, Babies mine. don't have their hands open. <laughs> Babies don't have their hands up. You know that? Mm -hmm. Babies born is like this. Did you know that? Yeah. yeah. See, uh, an infant is always like this. And the symbol of some people say is because a baby is naturally a taking, a taker. Right? He nurses and he cries and he wants. And he wants. He wants. He doesn't give. And if you want to take it, something, you, you have take to something replace it. He's crying. You have to pull it out of his hand. And put a, a, another new thing. Something. Give him something exactly. else. You exactly. try to distract him. He's, uh, he wants. He wants. He wants. And in growing uh, a little bit, and it takes a long time, in growing, a child learns to be empathetic and to give. Somebody like that. Mm -hmm. If somebody's crying, he says, oh, take this. That's a special, that's a special thing to learn. So for the one opinion is, that's not average. That's already something special. So the other person, he says, you know, in order to be a human being, you have to eventually learn to do that. You, uh, if you are an adult and you say, just leave me alone on my side and you stay on your side, you, you're not a human being yet. Mm. Right? You're bad. You're bad. So the question is, I mean, it is an achievement. It's an achievement to be nidvat lev, to be a generous spirit, right? Nidvat to luchom, be, to be generous. I mean, you make an appeal and feel and you see, I mean, mm -hmm. right. not so easy. I mean, I, and I am not boasting, I am not boasting. When you know today that there are people, right now as we're speaking, there's a child who's hungry and who's dying of starvation somewhere in the world, then that means we are bad. Mm -hmm. 
There's no question about it. I mean, how, how is it possible? There's not enough food in this world. Is there not enough food in this world? I mean, yeah? So I once talked about that. Poteach et yedecha o masbiya l'chol chai ratzon. Right? We say God opens his hand and he gives to all needy living things. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that God actually takes the sandwich and he gives it to the person who's hungry? I don't think I ever saw mm -hmm. God deliver a sandwich to somebody who's angry, right? Mm -hmm. But God created a world in which I could take a sandwich, there is sandwiches around, and I could take a sandwich and bring it to a, to a, to a, to a street person who needs to eat, right? God does that. God created such a world that there's bounty enough to feed people, and to feed animals, and to feed flies, and caterpillars, and eagles. Yeah, and but birds. that's different with and animals. We, and we just don't do it, right? And we just don't do it. But it's different with animals, but the people, because people, most of the people, doesn't worship the real God. That's one of the big problems that we have. Because and we and we worship the real God, but we don't feed the hungry. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I can't boast. I can't boast. It, uh, it takes, yeah. it takes, it takes waking up. I mean, people. It's easy to be in theory mm -hmm. generous, but mm -hmm. in in, in fact, practical. in fact, in practical terms, to be generous is a big, very big business. How do you organize the world in such a way that people will not be hungry? It's yeah. not just up to me. So I, I say. So I say. Okay, people are hungry in Biafra. Okay, I'll, I'll give. I'll give the food. No, so how does it get to? How, how do we create a, a society in which this is possible that it will happen? Mm -hmm. It won't be corruption and it won't be stolen and it won't be they won't be killed before they get it and they won't and somebody will deliver it and he, and the farmers here won't be feel bad that we're giving it away to them because if we give it away to them, then then uh, people won't buy it here, and, uh, you know, uh, it's very complicated, practical terms. Mm -hmm. Right. That's the way the, the very world works. Difficult. Yeah. Very difficult. The world shouldn't work that way, but the world is a big problem. Okay, so, um, and we learned, we learned about the, uh, the mirrors of the women last time, yes, so that's yes. okay. Yes. Then, then, oh, the actual ending of the, when the Mishkan is actually finished, there's a lot of details about the Mishkan's building, but the, the, if we skip to page, to, uh, to um, chapter 40, chapter 40, 40 in the day, chapter 40 in the day, yeah, chapter 40, uh, in, in verse day. in verse two, two. and the then in verse day. and then in verse thirty four. Goodness gracious! Wow, thirty four. Is there such a thing as verse thirty four? Yes. So let's see if we can do one. Oh my goodness! It's a long piece, so I don't know. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, let's, let's go to 34 first, because I think it's going to be shorter and we might be able to... So this is the climax, right? Hashem fills the, the tabernacle. Hashem's presence fills the tabernacle. It's uh, page, yeah, uh, chapter 40, verse 34. Yes. Yeah? Vayichas anan et olmoed. The cloud of glory covers the tabernacle. Amar. We want to tell you, covering means covering, right? That you have the Mishkan, everybody saw the tent, right? Everything is visible, and then a cloud covers it entirely. It no longer can be seen, right? The tabernacle only. The tabernacle no, is not the visible. No, people. people. People, now, the people are standing around. All right. And they look and they see the tabernacle and then suddenly there's a cloud covering the entire tabernacle. Like the Anan covered Harsinai. Right? Okay. Now, anyway. And the tabernacle is covered and swallowed up, so to speak, and, and submerged inside the, the cloud. Right? Hey, hidden in the cloud. 
Ukvod Hashem Malek HaMishkan. And the presence of God fills the Mishkan. Ki Tocho Malek HaKavod. The inside is filled with God's glory. The cloud is not God's glory. The cloud is a veil. Yes. The cloud is a cover. And so the Torah is telling you two things. The Pasuk says that. He's trying, to, he's, he's just trying to describe what the Torah is actually saying. These are not things he's making up. Right? He says, Vayichas, uh, chapter 40, verse 34. Vayichas ananat oel moed, the cloud covers oel moed, ukvod Hashem, and the presence of God, malei et mishkan, fills the mishkan. So one thing covers, the other one's filling. Hidden. Right? So the mishkan is a box, so to speak, right? The cloud covers it, and God fills his glory inside the mishkan. Right. So the cloud is not to be confused with his Hashem's glory. Right. So what's the cloud all about? What is, it's like, it's like uh, a beautiful woman walking with a veil, so nobody can mm-hmm. see her. I mean, in other words, what, what's, there are two things mm-hmm. going on here, right? So you might think God's glory is going to fill the mishkan. That's great. What's this cloud for? I mean, uh, you have to hide the Mishkan, in order for God to go into, to fill the Mishkan and his kavod inside? Mm. It's a mysterious thing. What's mm. the combination, right? What is the combination? So, mm. so we, maybe we're going to talk about that, right? Let's go on. Kavod shom alei mishkan, ki tocho malei ha-kavod, ki ha-kavod shochein betoche anan, because the, the glory is dwelling inside the cloud, tocha mishkan, inside the mishkan, ki inyan shnei mar v'har sinai, just like in har sinai. El Ha'arafel, Asher Shama Elohim. Moshe goes up into the cloud, into the mist, where God is within. Mm-hmm. Right? The Amar, Kilo Yachol Moshe Labo Elohel Moed, Afilu El Petach, Mipne Shaya Enan Mechaseed Bo. And the Torah is trying to tell you that Moshe could not go. Look at the next sentence. Velo Yachol Moshe Labo Elohel Moed, Kishachan Alav He Anan, Ukvod Hashem Malayet Amishkan. Moshe cannot approach the Mishkan now because the cloud descended upon it, mm-hmm. right? And the glory of God fills it, mm-hmm. right? And God and Moshe was not permitted to go into the cloud. Interesting, because on the mountain, if you remember, God invited Moshe to come. To come in. And he goes into the cloud right. where God was present inside. Right. Here, Moshe was not invited. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Right on. And, and of course, he could not go into the Mishkan because the glory of God is in it. And how could he go in? Two different things, right? And the reason that he could not go in there without permission... But only when God would call him to come into the cloud, Ah, he's trying to say this is a little bit like the, the Anan in Har Sinai because the cloud covered the mountain for a long time, for seven days before the Torah was given. God spoke to Moshe, prepare the people, I'm going to speak to them, da 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 be ready three days from now, and so on and so on and so on, right? Cleanse yourself, be ready, make sure that the mountain is circumscribed, that nobody should go on it. In the meantime, there's a cloud on the mountain. And Moshe did not go into the mountain. When the Torah was ready, when Hashem was ready to give the Torah, Vayikra, Moshe was called mm-hmm. by God to come up to me and I will talk to you the things I want to say. So by invitation, he could not go up until Hashem actually invited him. And he says that's what happened in the Mishkan also. Now Hashem comes down to dwell in the Mishkan. His glory goes in, the cloud covers, and like Har Sinai, people are standing outside, they wait. Moshe also cannot go in yet. He has to be invited to come in. All right? Like to that. Alder chapshat ba'avur shene'emar ba'idaber Hashem e'lav me'ol mo'ed the plain understanding, he says, is that when God speaks to Moshe from the tent, it says from the tent, not in the tent, right? From the Mishkan, he speaks to him, that Moshe didn't actually enter, but God calls him from 
the Ohel, from the Mishkan. He calls to him, and Moshe stands at the entrance to the tabernacle, to the Mishkan, and Hashem speaks to him. Right? So he's invited to come up to the point of entrance of the Mishkan, but he doesn't actually go in, and God speaks to him from within to speak to him. Okay? Rabbeinu Amru, that, that, that was, that's one understanding. He says, and our, our sages have said, Kadu Moshe seems to be a contradiction. One pasuk here says, Moshe could not go in. Mm-hmm. And another pasuk says, and when Moshe goes to Oral Moed, to speak to God. So it seems like one sentence says he could not go in, and the other one says, it seems like he could go in. So our plain understanding, remember, is that Moshe could not go in. That's the truth. And when Hashem would invite him, he would go up to a point, and Hashem speaks to him. But our sages said that since these two sentences seem to contradict each other, he chriu, they try to reconcile the contradiction, ki shachana lavana, that because at this point, when he could not go in, it says because the Anan had descended upon it. Ki ledaatam uvovo Moshe el oel moed sheyavo sham belo kriyat midato, o mipnei sheyamay sham vayishmai et kol medaber lav mei haporochet, nirei lahem sheya Moshe omeid betoch ha'o lefnei ha'kaporet. וכל עת היות כבוד השם מלא את המשכן, לא נכנס משה בתוכו. וואו, so according to the sages, this was um, not constant. Things changed. At this moment, when Hashem wanted to show that he had come to dwell among the people, this is what happened. The cloud covered and, the, and Hashem's glory entered the Mishkan. At that time, Moshe could not go in. Mm-hmm. That's it. That's one mm-hmm. event. Other times, it seems like Moshe did go in. So the only way to explain it is that this moment, which was very special, Hashem trying to tell them, I am now going to be with you, this was the moment when the cloud and the glory filled the Mishkan. But other times, Hashem retreated into the Kodesh Kodashim, into the Holy of Holies, and there was no more cloud covering the entire tabernacle. People could see the tabernacle after this event. This is a climax. This is a special time, right? It's very dramatic, right? Mm-hmm. But other times, and then Moshe could, other times when he, when Moshe wanted to talk to God, he would just walk to the Mishkan. He didn't have to be invited to come in. Mm-hmm. Not like what we said before, right? Moshe would go in all the way up to the Kaporet, which was in front of the Kodesh Kadashim. And there he would speak to God, and God would speak to him from within, right? Two different kind of stories, right? So what do you do with these two sentences? One sentence says, and Moshe could not go in because the cloud descended upon it, and Moshe and Hashem filled the Mishkan, our sentence. Mm-hmm. And at other times it says that when Moshe, when Moshe would go to the Mishkan to speak to God, Hashem would speak to him. So... Right? For above, they are called. Right. So it seems like, it seemed to the first explanation is this not allowed to go in continued throughout the 40 years, and Moshe would have to wait until he's invited, and his invitation would only allow him to come up to the entrance, just outside the entrance of the Mishkan. Not into the Mishkan, but only up to that point. And Hashem, if he wanted to speak to him, would invite him to come to there, and he would speak to him. That would be one understanding. Mm-hmm. Right? So, bevo, when, I sh- when we say in the Torah, and Moshe came, it means he came by invitation only to the entrance. So those, that's how the two sentences fit. Mm-hmm. Going to the others, they fit because they're two different times. One time, right now, in the climax, Hashem filled the entire tabernacle and the cloud covered... Moshe could not go in at all. True. That is true. After this, the cloud rose. The Hashem's dwelling, Hashem's glory in the Mishkan retreated into the Kodesh Kodashim, into the Holy of Holies. And Moshe, special person, without invitation, could go in at at those other times, could go into the Mishkan, not only to the entrance, but all the way inside, up to the Kodesh Kodashim. 
And even when he, Moshe, without invitation, wanted to say something to God. So God, what am I going to do about this? And what should I do about that? And let me ask you a question. He was able to do that when he wanted, when Moshe wanted, without invitation. And God would speak to him from, from his prophecy, would come to him from the Kodesh Kodeshim to him, standing here inside. Two completely different scenarios, right? Right? right. right? And then we do... Mm-hmm. Right? And that happened when the cloud had arisen, right? And the kavod, the God's glory, was not filling the, the whole Mishkan. This time, which is dis- described now with the whole Mishkan being filled with the glory and the cloud covering it, only happened at the climax of the eighth day of the inauguration of the Mishkan, when the Mishkan actually was first completed. Right? That was the special day. That's when this happened. Right? Good. So when God spoke, invited him to come, according to those explanations, it's up only to the front during that time. Okay, like we said. Okay. And when we say that Hashem is dwelling in the Mishkan, it means that it is dwelling all the way inside, in the Kodesh Kodeshim. Okay. I want to tell you that yeah, there's a little poetry at the end. I want to tell you that yeah. uh, the Ramban has a very special uh, introduction to this whole... This is the end of the book of, mm-hmm. Gen- of, of Exodus, right? So the Ramban, at the very beginning, when he's about to describe this whole book that's going to be the book of Exodus, he says the book of Exodus is the book of the slavery of the Jewish people and their redemption from slavery. So you might ask, so you talk about the slavery and you talk about their freedom from slavery. So the end of the book should be when they left Mitzrayim. Or if you want to postpone it a little bit, you can make it after Kriyat Yamsuf, after the splitting of the Red Sea, because that's when the Egyptians are destroyed. Or maybe you can go a little bit later and uh, talk about how Amalek was uh, defeated and that they arrived at Har Sinai. And if you want to go a little bit later, you could say that the real freedom from slavery was when God made them his people in Har Sinai. Besides, okay, but what's this business of the tabernacle doing in the book of being freed from slavery? You would think that if you want the tabernacle to be described and how to build it and how the holiness fills the tabernacle, you should put that in the beginning of the next book. Because the next book talks about the sacrifices of the Mishkan and the Avodah in the Mishkan and all the things that happened in the Mishkan and the everyday service that was going to be in the Mishkan, right? So you might think that you should stop somewhere in the story of the Exodus, either after Mitzrayim or after Kiyat Yamsuf or after Amalek or after Matan Torah, you could say, you know, the climax of being God's people is going out of slavery and becoming God's people. So at R.C. 9. Good. Stop. Right? You could say that you want to go a little bit later and you talk about how they failed with the Egel and how God then tells them, okay, I forgive you, and he gives them the second Luchot. Okay. Right? But what's this? Why describe the Mishkan and all of its details and the actual happening that uh, the dwelling of the Mishkan with uh, God's glory should be in this book? It should be in, in Leviticus. So he says, you know what? When a person is a slave, he is homeless. He doesn't have his own place. He is bereft. Doesn't, nothing belongs to him. And he is commanded by other people what he's going to do. He's, he's a non-person, right? When a slave is freed and finally has a home, that's when he's really free. Right? Not just that he walks out of his slave mm-hmm. free. Not just when they let him out of jail, but when he actually makes a life. Right, when he actually makes a life. And for the Jewish people, making a life was not just making a tent for him and his wife and his children, but making a life was was to have 
the people assembled around their God in their midst, that's home. They've arrived. They've arrived. More symbolically free even than coming to Eretz Yisrael. You might have thought maybe the whole story should be from beginning of Mitzrayim all the way to the, to, the, to the promised land, right? But he's saying that in wherever they happen to be, happens to be in the desert, but once a person accomplishes freedom, freedom physically, freedom politically, and then freedom psychologically, right? Mm -hmm. That he's actually made his home, gotten the families, gotten God in their midst, that's the end of the freedom story. Not just getting to Torah, but actually making the Mishkan. It's mm -hmm. part of the freedom story, and therefore it belongs to the, in, in the book of Exodus, according to the, according to the Ramban. He he's describes that way, way back in the beginning of... I think okay. the first part of the freedom, because the second part would be entering. Enter, enter, enter. So that's another drama, there's another long story yet, right? But to him, this is actually the end of what made them a free people right now. Mm -hmm. And that's a very interesting thing to hear the Ramban say, because the Ramban to the Ramban, Eretz Israel, and actually being in Eretz Israel is like supreme, mm -hmm. supreme. He has a statement elsewhere in his commentary on the Torah that anybody who leaves who is not in Eretz Israel is like he has no God. You know that, right? Mm -hmm. so it's, it's the land of God. It's the land of the people. So for him to say that the end of the freedom story is actually here in the middle of the desert with the Mishkan among them is quite something for him to say, right? I mean, it's a country, it's, it's startling. For him to say, he would say that that would come more naturally from a non-Zionist person, right? Because it's just yeah, yeah. But they've arrived. You but made it's a, me. It's a spiritual home they make. You made me think that when you say that, like at the veil of the the wedding, but that was that was the the, the real scenario because uh, Moshe wanted to go into the. The ten, and it's like a, the, the 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 guy that is going to see his wife, and his wife is covered with the bell, mm -hmm. and he wants to approach her, but uh, first he has to do, or at least we know in Judaism we have to do two steps. One is the kedushin, and the last is the kedushin, the kedushin, the kedushin. So. It's like the same thing that Moshe did, isn't it? And that's the way that we have to do after the sixth millennium, when we were entering to the seven Shabbos. You know what I mean? You're being, you're getting Kabbalistic again on me. Um, a little bit, <laughs> but he's saying, he's saying that he couldn't. Enter. He couldn't enter until uh, God withdraws. Yes, so he said, and he called on to Moses on the seventh day out of in the midst of the cloud. So, but the tabernacle was on Arsinai. 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 Yeah, exactly. So, this is we, the eighth day. This is we the, entered, this happened on the eighth day of. We the really day. entered in the tabernacle in the seventh day, in the seventh millennium, to go after on the eighth day. That is when the tabernacle was tabernacle was finished. Field. Yes. No. Yeah. That's what I am saying. Mm. Okay. Maybe crazy, but uh, okay. No, not be crazy. <laughs> not <be> crazy. <laughs> I not know crazy. stealing word from my master, uh, uh, my master uh, Ramban. Ramban, but uh, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank okay, you. Okay, I never master. got to. It was very good. Wonderful. Thank you, may I have a good session. Amen, amen. Give you more wisdom. I need